In the previous video, I announced I was gonna make my own 10 gigabit router from scratch and today we're diving headfirst into the intricate world of PCB planning. But before we get started, let me share one good wisdom from my otherwise not so good boss from about 20 years ago. A good plan is have the work done. So let's apply that wisdom as we sketch out a block diagram for our router in which we'll go through all the specs and features including the CPU choice. In case you missed my previous video, which I'll link to up here and down in the description, here are the features I want this router to have. It needs to have 10 gig capable ports, at least two. Ideally, one RJ45 and one SFP+. We initially planned three with the team that's going to design the actual physical PCB, but we found a CPU that only has two, but fits all other requirements perfectly, so we dropped the extra port. We could still add it with some workarounds, which I'll explain in the next video in this series, and we still might, but keep in mind that every 10 gigabit port adds roughly $100 to the final price of the device. Subscribe to the channel and leave a comment if you want to know why. The next requirement is a couple of gigabit ports. Again, our chosen CPU supports four, so that's perfect. Then we also need enough RAM and storage. Let's say eight gigabytes for the RAM and 64 for the storage. We chose these amounts because it's more than enough to satisfy the requirements of most open source firewall slash routing solutions out there. And to meet the final, for me personally, very important requirement, it has to handle at least a gigabit of intrusion detection and prevention. Depending on the amount of rules you set up, it can be a very demanding task for the CPU to perform. And since the world is slowly moving towards homes having a gigabit internet connection, I want to make sure you guys are safe. Maybe not from trolls on Twitter and Reddit, but definitely from malicious network activities. I guess by this point I shared enough information that I can also reveal what CPU we went with. The one that satisfied all the requirements I just mentioned is called Layerscape 1046A by a company called NXP. We'll talk more about it from a technical perspective in one of the future videos, but for now I just want you to keep in mind the approximate price of the processor. It costs around $73. Why is that relevant? Two reasons. First, I want you to start getting sense of how much it costs to manufacture a router that supports 10 gigabit connectivity as it will become very important in a couple of weeks. And second, in my previous video, people have asked me why not an Intel CPU such as N95 or N100. Well, primarily because of the price. The N100 retails at $128, which is almost twice the price of the Layerscape. Plus, unlike the Layerscape, it has no dedicated Ethernet interfaces built in, so we'd need to add more chips to the PCB, further increasing the cost. And last but not least, it comes with a GPU, which we don't need, but have to pay for it anyway. If we went with an x86 architecture, we'd most likely choose an embedded Ryzen or an Epic CPU, simply because they seem to be much more tailored to networking infrastructure. All that being said though, this whole project is so early in its development that you all have a voice in which direction it goes. If everyone starts screaming at the top of their lungs by using the comments below that you absolutely positively demand, demand, demand an Intel or an AMD chip, well, then we'll consider it. No promises though. Now enough with the chips, as we need to focus on our block diagram, which is completely chip agnostic. Let's first talk about what a block diagram even is. As per Wikipedia, it's a diagram of a system in which the principal parts or functions are represented by blocks connected by lines that show relationships between those blocks. A bunch of blocks then. Okay, let's draw our first one. If you come from a PC world, and I imagine most of you do, what is the first component you usually think of when planning a new PC? And no, it's not the GPU, although you do think about it a lot, but that's just because it hurts your wallet the most. No, it's the CPU. So let our first block be the CPU. What does the CPU need for it to work? Well, obviously, power. 
electric power that is. So let's put PD in the next block. PD stands for power delivery. Notice that we didn't put PSU because this is an appliance, so we will use an external power brick. And don't worry, it won't be one of those massive ones because the CPU only consumes around 15 watts when at full load. Now let's turn our attention to one of the less obvious ones, the clocks. We will need two clock generator chips, but I'll just use one block for both. The first one that we need is an RTC or a real-time clock. Computers or electronics in general have no idea how time passes, so they need to have some kind of a reference. For that, we use special crystal oscillators that when powered oscillate at a particular frequency, most often 32,768 kHz. At first, this number looks relatively random, but is actually a very convenient one because it can also be expressed as 2 to the power of 15, which makes it super easy to calculate with binary circuits. I bet that's a fact you didn't know. The other clock that we also need to include in our diagram is the base clock generator. Similarly to the real-time clock we just mentioned, this 100 MHz clock serves as the coordinator between the CPU and all other components on the PCB. Think of it as a system's heartbeat. Now since we normally measure modern CPU speeds in GHz, what the CPU does is use a configurable multiplier to determine how many cycles it can run per each base clock cycle. A 5 GHz Intel or AMD CPU, for example, has a multiplier of 50 and you are often able to either set it in the BIOS or let the CPU manage it itself. The CPU now has power and can run at the speed it was designed to, but we're still missing a few key components. Yes, you're thinking right, we need to add memory. I don't think I need to explain what it does and we already mentioned the quantity so we'll just continue and talk about storage. Two kinds, a NAND flash and a NOR flash. I don't think I need to explain anything about NAND flash because well it's basically what most modern solid state drives use and chances are you already have one in your computer. If not, I think it's high time to consider an upgrade. Unlike NAND though, which we use for the operating system storage, NORFLASH comes in much smaller sizes, usually measured in megabytes, well, megabits. In embedded systems, it's used primarily for the boot code. Think of it as an equivalent of BIOS. When the CPU and the rest of the components receive power and wake up, they have no idea what they should do first or what their purpose is. The code in the NOR flash gets executed first and solves that problem. Before we continue, let's make a review of what we have assembled so far. We have a CPU, power, clocks, memory and storage. At this point, you could say we have a functional general purpose embedded device. Well, it doesn't have any peripherals yet, so it's more of a no purpose embedded device. To remedy that, let's turn it into a router. By the way, a mate of mine said I should pronounce it as router, not router. What do you think? Or better yet, write in the comments below how you pronounce it. And if English is not your native language, also write the word you use in that. In Slovenia, where I'm from, we say usmerjevalnik. Unlike what we've done so far, meaning we drew components from the CPU outwards, we're gonna do it the other way around now and first draw our ports. We'll draw the four gigabit ports together and you'll see the reason why shortly. Then we'll draw the 10 gigabit port on its own and finally the SFP plus port. Let's use dashes for that one. Next, let's add magnetics. Despite the somewhat fancy name, magnetics serve a very simple function. We use the word electricity, but in its proper name, it's called electromagnetic energy. And one of the main passive components we use today is the transformer. It's two separate wires or coils wound around what's known as the transformer core. These two coils never touch each other, but still transfer electrical energy from one to the other. Now take a tiny transformer and put it in series with the pairs of wires or should I say traces on the PCB that come from the CPU and the ones that go into the RJ45 jack and you have just electrically isolated the two sides. And as a result, we added EMI shielding, protection against transients and signal balancing. Did I say it was a simple function that magnetics perform? Anyway, we're not done yet. We need a device that will transmit the actual electrical signal over twisted pairs of wires. We've chosen a CPU that offers 4 gigabit and two 10 gigabit 
interfaces, similar to your wall socket just being an interface for electricity. Your house doesn't care what you plug into them, it can be either a microwave, a hairdryer or a PC. In electronics, networking interfaces are called Media Independent Interfaces or MII and they come in several variants which I won't go into detail here. Uh, but I will leave a link in the description below. Even if this is the first time you hear about media independent interface, that doesn't mean that you haven't seen its use. It's where the MAC addresses come from. We won't go into networking layers or what is called the OSI model in this video, but what you need to know is that in the OSI model, MAC addresses represent the second layer, just above the physical layer, which is exactly what we'll add to our diagram next. We need a device that converts our Ethernet frames from layer 2 to actual electrical signals on the physical level, or layer 1, which is where a chip aptly named as Phi or PHI comes in. And this is also where my suggestion to click that like button comes in. Thank you. Regarding the Phi chips, we will use two. One for the 4 gigabit ports. Yes, they can be combined into one Phi chip and one for the 10 gig port. The other 10 gig port won't need one because SFP and SFP Plus modules already have a Phi chip integrated. What we will need though is a chip called a retimer, whose primary job is to make sure that the high speed signal coming from and to the CPU is clean enough to enter the SFP Plus module where it will likely be transmitted over distances sometimes measured in kilometers. Hence the need of those signals being clean. Are we done? Almost. In terms of the non-networking related connectors, we'll add three. All of them most likely USB Type-C, but each serving a different purpose. We'll use the first one for power. 5 volts is all we need for this device to run and we won't need more than say 35 watts, which will let us get away with something really small. Something like this. The second port will be what is most often referred to as a console port. You've seen this port in all kinds of shapes and sizes. COM ports, RJ45, USB-A, USB-C, you name it. The interface on the CPU for this port is called or known as UART, U-A-R-T, and just like with the networking interface, we'll need a converter chip that will adapt the UART to USB-C. On a Mac, it is then possible to connect to this device using a USB-C cable and the screen command in the terminal. This gets us what looks very much like an SSH access does when accessing remote Linux servers. The third and the last USB-C we'll use on the device is a standard port or what is called a host port. So you'll be able to plug in, say, a USB drive and copy files over. There have it. Our block diagram is pretty much complete. But before you leave, I have a small request. If you see yourself as a potential owner of this router, please fill out the very short form which I'll link to in the description below. It just has a couple of pricing related questions which are very important to me at this stage and will help us shape the final price of the device. And make sure you're subscribed because I will explain how and why in one of the future videos. See ya!